What I do to her? What you do to her? Tell us what you did to her. Go to her. With what? The bell. This twisted predator brutally murdered his 17-year-old neighbor, who was also working for him. And as if that's not already horrifying enough, he tried to justify his actions, making it sound like he was somehow the victim. She thought she was going to seduce me and it wasn't going to happen. Think she got carried away? But it doesn't stop there. While the girl's parents were frantically searching for her, this monster had the nerve to play the role of a concerned neighbor, comforting them while he knew exactly where she was. Makes me sick. And he didn't just murder her, he left her sit in that house. The details of this case are truly chilling and will leave you questioning just how dark a person can be. But to understand this twisted story, we need to start at the beginning. My daughter didn't deserve this. You know, we just want answers right now. We just want answers as to why. Why wouldn't you do this? Because her and him had a bond like they they were friends. Valerie Tyndall was a smart, sweet, and funny 17-year-old girl who loved video games, singing, and spending time with her family and friends. She was also an animal lover and dreamed of becoming a veterinarian. Her parents, Sheena and Jack, had originally lived in Indianapolis, but after she was born, they moved the family to the quiet town of Arlington, Indiana, hoping to leave behind the dangers that came with the big city. At first, it seemed like they had found their escape, a welcoming town, friendly neighbors, and a house that finally felt like home. But just when everything seemed right, an unexpected darkness crept in, turning their dream of peace into a nightmare. Anything else that you guys want to say? Dad? I don't know how somebody could do anything like this. He's a monster, and his wife needs to be prosecuted with her. Absolutely. Valerie was set to be a senior at Rushville Consolidated High School and was supposed to graduate in 2024. Over the years, she tried a few different jobs after school and on the weekends, like working at McDonald's or Domino's, but the one that she really enjoyed was doing lawn care. Patrick Scott, a 59-year-old neighbor from across the street who owned a lawn care business in Maplewood, offered her the job when she was just 15. Her main duties included riding lawnmowers, cutting grass, and traveling to job sites with Patrick. Patrick. Patrick was married to a woman named Linda, and they had kids and grandkids around Valerie's age. His family seemed like ideal neighbors, friendly and supportive, and they became close with Valerie's family. Valerie would often spend time with them outside of work and was even friends with Patrick's granddaughter. She worked for him, right? They did. She worked for him, but she also hung out with his family, like his granddaughter was her friend, and we went places with them, me and him, and her and him, and family, like everybody went together. So Patrick was more than just Valerie's boss. He was a family friend, and the Tyndall family completely trusted him. However, that would be shattered in the most horrifying way. On Wednesday, June 7th, 2023, Valerie left home telling her family she was going to work. Her mom, Sheena, thought it was a bit weird because Valerie didn't usually work on Wednesdays, but she brushed it off thinking that maybe her schedule or her workload had changed. But as evening came and Valerie still hadn't returned, Sheena began to worry. She called Valerie's phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Then she called Patrick to check if her daughter was still at work. But to her shock, Patrick told her that Valerie didn't work that day and he hadn't seen her since the day before. It started getting late. I noticed it was probably six or so. And I said, well, she should be home by now, I would think. So I called Scott after I called Valerie probably three times and her phone would go straight to voicemail. And I thought, well, that's not usual. I don't understand why it's going straight to voicemail. And so... I called him and he says, no, she didn't work today. Sheena was in a total panic, trying to figure out where her daughter could have gone. She called all of Valerie's friends and everyone else she could think of around town, hoping someone had seen or heard from her, but no one had. Meanwhile, Patrick and his wife, Linda, being the good neighbors that they were, came over to offer their support. But while they were there, Patrick made a strange comment, suggesting that Valerie might have run away. And his wife backed him up, mentioning she'd also run away from home at 17. But Sheena was not buying it. Asking me if I was okay and telling us, oh, I'm sure she's fine, she'll be back home. Sheena was afraid that something bad happened to her daughter. And so the next morning, she called the Rush County Sheriff's Department and reported her missing. 
At first, the police suspected that Valerie might have run away, so they looked into her social media and phone records to track her down. But soon they discovered that she had been spending a lot of time alone with her boss outside of work. There were even pictures of the two of them visiting an aquarium. Now, Valerie's parents knew about this aquarium trip with Patrick, but they thought that his whole family would be there too. So seeing a photo of just the two of them raised serious concerns. But it gets more weird. Sheena told investigators that Patrick had even put a tracker on Valerie's phone. Super creepy, right? Where did he come home and told me that? She said something about him. He had placed her on his 360 plan. I didn't even know what that was. And she explained it to me and I was like, why? I'm like, why are you on that? She said, I don't know, he just added me on it with his family because they're all on it. And I said, well, but you're not his kids or his wife or anything. He has no reason to even be tracking them as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't track my family. It's not normal to me. Sheena also admitted that she sometimes got strange vibes about how Patrick acted around Valerie, almost as if he was a jealous boyfriend. But whenever she mentioned it to Valerie, her daughter would shrug it off, assuring her it was nothing like that. So Sheena would tell herself that she was probably overthinking it and let it go. As investigators kept digging into Valerie's social media, they noticed that her phone had not been turned on in a while, which was very odd for a teenager. But even more unusual was that her social media activity had completely stopped. This was alarming for someone like Valerie, who was an active social media user. So on June 10th, just two days after she was reported missing, police issued a statewide silver alert for her. Rush County Sheriff's Department is asking for your help finding a missing 17-year-old. This is Valerie Tyndall. She is missing from Arlington, Indiana. She was last seen around noon on Wednesday. The Sheriff's Department says she is believed to be in extreme danger. The search for Valerie was now in full swing with her family, friends, and the entire community joining the police in looking for her. Patrick and his wife continued to support Valerie's parents, visiting daily to comfort them and reassure them that she'd be back soon. In his first interview with the police, Patrick repeated what he had already told Valerie's parents, that he hadn't seen her on June 7th. But then a witness came forward saying that they'd overheard a conversation the day before she went missing. Patrick had reportedly told Valerie that he planned to take her to Indianapolis on June 7th for lunch, saying he'd take her someplace special. On top of this, another witness also came forward saying that they had seen Patrick driving Valerie's car the day she went missing. This new information completely shifted the focus of the investigation and Patrick was now considered a person of interest. Meanwhile, investigators held a press conference asking the public for help in finding Valerie and her car, a green 2000 Honda Accord with an Indiana license plate. On June 26, nearly three weeks after Valerie went missing, her car was found outside an apartment complex in the nearby town of Shelbyville. Investigators also found out that Patrick had done some landscaping work there, so they brought him in for questioning. At first, he stuck to his story, denying he'd seen Valerie that day. But when they mentioned that witnesses saw him driving her car, he quickly changed his story. So I, I spoke to you at your house on, um, I think it was Saturday, June 10th. Um, I saw you outside. Do you remember me stopping by? Yes. Okay. And I asked you that day when you saw Valerie last, right? Right. And you remember what you told me? Tuesday. Told me Tuesday before Wednesday, the Wednesday before she gone, right? Right. And that's not true, is it? No. Okay. When was the last time you saw Valerie? Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday afternoon. Where did you meet up with her at? South High Gardens. South High Gardens in Shelbyville. Yes. Okay. So in this new version of events, Patrick admitted he did see Valerie that Wednesday at the South High Garden Apartments in Shelbyville. He said she got into his truck and then asked him to drop her off in a place called Homer, about five miles from their neighborhood. According to Patrick, when he dropped her off, she got in this little blue car with some guy he didn't recognize. And get this, he also couldn't identify the make or the model of the vehicle. After dropping her off, Patrick claimed he had gone home. Then on Thursday, he said he went back to the South High Gardens apartment, took Valerie's car, and parked it at the Berwick Apartments, which is where the police eventually found it. He said he did this because Valerie had asked him to. Why did you do that? Because she was about to take off. So you don't give her a car to use? No. No, I'm just going to give her a ride. Okay, so she so she calls you on, Tues on Tuesday? No, she told me a couple days before she was going to leave. Okay. So she I, I didn't think she'd go through with it, but she did. Okay. 
So she planned this with you? Well, she planned it. I just... You went along. You just went along. Yeah. Okay. But here's the thing. Valerie's phone last pinged near Arlington, not Homer, and Patrick claimed she was texting a lot while they were together. But her phone records showed the last text she sent was actually to Patrick at 11.23 a.m. saying, I'll be there soon. So, yeah, it's pretty clear Patrick wasn't telling the whole truth, but what was he hiding? As detectives kept pressing him, Patrick changed his story again. He now claimed that after meeting Valerie, he took her back to his house and left her there while he went to work. But when he got back, she was already gone. So you have no idea where this girl's at? No, I have none whatsoever. I swear to God, I don't know where she is. It is hard to believe you on that. Just I know. For the mere fact. I know. You, you lied to us from the very beginning. I know. I, I, but I do not know where she's at. I really don't. We probably could have found her a lot. We probably could have found her. Right? Maybe. By this point, investigators were fed up with the stories he was feeding them, so they arrested him for providing false information to law enforcement. He was, however, released on bond. Meanwhile, Valerie's family was still hanging on to hope that she would come home. But as the months passed, that hope started to fade. On October 11th of 2023, investigators brought in cadaver dogs to search Patrick's property. And the dogs actually picked up the scent of human remains in a pond near his house. But when they searched it, they didn't find anything. Police then suggested that the scent might have drifted over from another part of the property. So the next day, an aerial scan was done over Patrick's land as investigators looked for anything unusual. And they found several spots where the ground looked disturbed. Then, on November 28, 2023, almost six months after Valerie disappeared, law enforcement executed search warrants on multiple properties, including Patrick's home and another property he owned nearby. During an excavation, they found disturbed soil leading to two boxes buried close together. Tragically, it was in one of those boxes buried deep into the ground that they would find Valerie's decomposed remains. She was identified by the orange nail polish she had been wearing the day she went missing. We have been working tirelessly on this case since its inception. She was going to go to college. She was accepted and uh, now she'll never have a chance. This is not the outcome we had all hoped for. Justice will be sought for Valerie. And we start first at four with a tragic breaking news update. After six months of searching, investigators in Rush County say the search for 17-year-old Valerie Tyndall is over following the discovery of a body. FBI agents, state troopers, and Rush County Sheriff's deputies were out at Scott's house, which sits about 100 yards away from where Valerie and her parents lived. A source told me that late Tuesday afternoon, investigators recovered human remains from an inside a barrel buried under a pile of rubble from a garage Scott tore down a month after the girl disappeared. And Scott was arrested and charged with murder after he watched investigators search his property, specifically the rubble pile out back where the body was discovered. Process of it, he was interviewed and then they were not on site. Following this horrific discovery, Patrick had no choice but to admit to the crime. But get this, he actually tried to justify his actions. She tried to blackmail me into buying her a car. Okay, it won't happen. She thought she was going to seduce me and it wasn't going to happen. Then she got carried away. Well, explain that to me. What's that mean? Does Linda know about it? Okay. Nobody knows. Your chance to tell me what happened. She tried to seduce me and I wasn't going to happen. But what happened to Valerie? That's where you're stopping. So according to him, Valerie had tried to seduce and blackmail him into buying her a car. And when he refused, he said he had no choice but to take her life. He then went into disturbing detail about what he did afterward. What did I do to her? What did you do to her? Tell us what you did to her. With what? A belt. Okay. And then what did you do with it? I moved her into the office. Okay. How long was she in there? Until the next day. Okay. What did, um, where's the bell at? It's gone. Okay. You left her in the office till the next day. Then what happened? Then when I got home the next day, I just made that box. Okay. What about the hole? The hole was already dug. 
But it wasn't for that. It was because I was throwing concrete in it. So you were what room were you in when you were there? Right there by my bedroom. So you said she tried to seduce you for the car. Well, explain to me what happened. She was wanting to come on to me. Did she say she was going to get you in trouble or? Yeah, she was going to tell everybody that I was making moves on her. Okay. And wasn't going to, I wasn't going to have it. Okay. Just things got out of hand. Where'd the belt come from? It was mine. I had it on. You had it on? Okay. So explain to me what happened there in that room. Like, how'd you get the belt on her? I was fighting her off and I took it and threw it around her. Why were you guys fighting? Because she was trying to get, she tried to take her clothes off. Okay. And it wasn't going to do it. Okay. And then you guys got in a fight? Yeah, kind of a push and a shove it thing right there. Okay. And then you took your belt off and then what happened? I put it around her. I held on to it until she quit. After taking Valerie's life, Patrick told detectives that he wrapped her in plastic and tape, placing her in a homemade box, screwed it shut, and then wheeled it out to a hole in his property. Then he was asked if he'd planned this, and he said, it just kind of happened. So because of the blackmail, did you, was that your intention to kill her? To avoid the blackmail? Gonna tell everybody that I had my way with her. That never happened. Okay. So then, was that, I mean, was that your plan? Like, if you were going to be blackmailed, right? Right. So was that the reason, was that the plan to kill her? No, that just kind of happened. Okay. Because she was going to blackmail her. Yeah. The reason he gave for this gruesome crime sounds ridiculous. But unfortunately, we may never fully know what happened at his house that day. However, court records do give some clues as to the timeline of when it happened. They show Valerie's phone was last active around 12.59 p.m. After Valerie disappeared, Patrick deleted several apps from his own phone, except for his Apple Health app. The app was running in the background on June 7th, and it showed a spike in his activity around 1.35 p.m., meaning his heart rate was up, likely because he was moving a lot or doing something physically intense, just about 36 minutes after Valerie arrived. What is even more disturbing is that after using the belt on Valerie, Patrick told detectives he just put it back on and went about his day like nothing happened. He even showed up at Valerie's home, pretending to be the caring friend, all while knowing exactly what he'd done. How sick is that? Makes me sick. And he didn't just murder her, he left her sit in that house. In a gut-wrenching moment of clarity, Valerie Tyndall's mom and dad, Sheena Sandifer and Jack Tyndall, broke down in tears multiple times as they spoke to me for more than an hour, going over the gruesome details in their 17-year-old daughter's murder. The way he described everything so no heartlessly, there was no, it was like it was not even a human being speaking. She's worked for him for two years and he, there's no remorse yeah. at all. In March 2024, Patrick was sentenced to 57 years in prison after pleading guilty to Valerie's murder. He was also ordered to pay $10,000 restitution to Valerie's family. Valerie's case is truly disturbing. It really shows how little we know about the people living right next door. You could be living next to someone you think is just an ordinary neighbor, but in reality, they could be a predator just waiting for their next victim. It is terrifying to think about. But what do you think about this case? And if you thought this was disturbing, just wait until you see our next video. You won't believe what's coming. Meanwhile, like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. 911, what's your emergency? Yes, honey, Dakota County 911. This is them. What's, what's wrong, dear? Listen, 631 flying drive to Rose. Somebody has my daughter. Somebody in full camouflage got Harley. Glad they took her to the woods. Please get everybody out there. This is the frantic voice of Holly Bobo's mother, minutes after she disappeared from her home. She was last seen alive by her brother walking into the woods outside her home with a man wearing camouflage. I left where I was standing and I walked over to the back door and that's when I saw a male and a female walking towards the woods and I recognized the female as my sister and I this time still thought the male was Drew. Years later, her partial remains would be found in northern Decatur County with a bullet wound to the back of the head. Say to the bubble, 
that I'm sorry for the loss. That all got shattered because of these men. But what really happened to Holly? Who was the man in camouflage? Did the police arrest the real killers? Or did they make a terrible mistake? Let's explore. Holly Bobo was a 20-year-old nursing student at the University of Tennessee. She lived in Decatur County with her parents, Karen and Dana Bobo, and her older brother, Clint, who was 25 years old. She was also the cousin of the country singer, Whitney Duncan. She's beautiful, kind of shy, quiet girl until you get to know her, and then she's just funny and sweet, and uh, she's amazing. Those who knew Holly described her as shy and sweet. She was raised in a Christian household and was extremely close with her mother, Karen, who was a teacher at a local elementary school. Holly also had a long-term boyfriend named Drew Scott, and the two were planning a future together, with Drew even giving her a promise ring. Sadly, this future would be cruelly cut short on the fateful morning of April 13th, 2011. Holly was preparing for an 8 a.m. exam, so she got up pretty early at 4.30 a.m. Her mom, Karen, had packed a lunch for her before heading to work. She was sitting at the kitchen table studying, and I kissed her goodbye and told her I loved her, just like every other morning. Her boyfriend, Drew, called her at 7.30 a.m. to tell her that he was turkey hunting nearby at her grandma's property. After a brief conversation, Holly gathered her stuff and made her way to her Mustang in the attached garage, ready to head to school. At 7.40 a.m., one of her neighbors heard a loud scream coming from the Bobo's home. He immediately informed his mother, who then called Karen and told her what was happening. Meanwhile, Holly's brother, Clint, was woken up by the barking of the family dogs. When he went to investigate, he saw his sister outside with a man dressed in camouflage. At first, Clint thought the man was Holly's boyfriend, Drew. It appeared to be Holly kneeling down and Drew. They looked like they were kneeled down facing each other in the garage and they were talking back and forth. Holly sounded very upset and heated. He was doing much of the talking and she would answer back and things like that. I couldn't make out hardly any of the words. The only words I could make out from here were Holly saying, no, why? Clint said that he believed the couple was breaking up and didn't want to get involved. So he tried calling his mom instead to check if Holly didn't have school. When Karen didn't answer, he left her a text message hoping that she would call back. Meanwhile, Karen had already received the call from the neighbor. In a panic, she called Clint and told him that the man was not Drew. I don't know what made me say it. I just, this instant panic came over me and I said, that's not Drew call all the neighbors, I think is what I said. And then I ran over to the office and I called 911. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I remember they said it was Henderson County. We live in Decatur County, so I hung up. I think I fell on the floor at that point. I guess I called Clint back, but I don't really remember now if it was from the library phone or the office phone that he was still talking about was Holly not going to school today. Was she turkey hunting with Drew? And I said, that's not Drew. And at some point I said, get a gun and shoot him. Clint was confused and asked his mom if she wanted him to shoot Drew. But Karen hung up to call 911. Clint then looked outside again and saw Holly and the man walking towards the nearby woods. I left where I was standing and I walked over to the back door and that's when I saw a male and a female walking towards the woods and I recognized the female as my sister and I as this time still thought the male was Drew. But then he noted that the guy was bigger than Drew and this is where the story gets weird. Instead of grabbing the gun like his mother had asked him and chasing after the guy who was clearly abducting his sister, Clint tried calling his sister's cell phone, as well as Drew's, but neither of them answered. When his mother called again, Clint was still in the house and told her what he had witnessed. His mother was the one who actually told him to call 911. Clint then took a loaded pistol and went outside, where he found a puddle of red near Holly's car. That's when he dialed 911. Authorities arrived at the scene at around 8.10 a.m. and the investigation began. Clint described the man who took Holly as being between 5'10 and 6 feet, weighing 180 to 200 pounds and having dark hair sticking out from under his cap that was long enough to cover his neck and touch his collar. He said the man was wearing a hat and camouflage clothes from head to toe, and his voice was deep and low. This description confirmed that Holly's boyfriend, Drew, was not the one who had taken her. 
Investigators also confirmed that the red stains found in the garage belonged to Holly. This confirmed that there was a struggle and Holly was taken away unwillingly. Cell phone pings showed Holly's phone moving away from her home and heading north toward a wooded area near Interstate 40 before stopping around 8.30 to 9 a.m. for about 30 minutes. It began moving again, heading south in a completely different route. The last cell phone ping was in the woods where her phone was later found with the SIM card removed. Holly's parents arrived home to find their home swamped by law enforcement agents, including the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, TBI, the FBI, SWAT, and U.S. Marshals. But despite being so many of them, they seemed uncoordinated, with many just standing around, unsure of what they were supposed to be doing. They had not started a search party or even spoken to the neighbors. The area had also not been cornered off as a crime scene, and people were just around at will. This includes the garage where Holly's blood was found on the floor. But after a lot of pressure from Holly's family, police finally mobilized people and began to search for the missing 20-year-old. What we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and divide up into groups. Time is of the essence. Every hour that passes is crucial. Any tip could be the key. Y'all go ahead and spread out. That's why authorities are turning to the public in the disappearance of Holly Bobo, a beautiful 20-year-old nursing student who hasn't been seen in a week. Just before 8 o'clock last Wednesday morning, Holly's 25-year-old brother Clint told police he watched from inside the family home as a man in camouflage led Holly into the woods. At first, Clint thought she was going off with a friend, but when he went outside, he found blood in the driveway and immediately called 911. The police went into high gear, searching for the man in camouflage. We feel that she knew that she was in fear of her life, so she was complying with his command. The family begged for help. Holly, I love you so much. <laughs> please, please try to get home to us. And if anybody knows anything about her, please, please help us find her. The entire community rallied together to help find Holly, with law enforcement using all available resources, including helicopters and search dogs to help speed up the search. Holly's family members, including her cousin, Whitney Duncan, appeared on TV begging for the public's help in finding Holly. The last phone call you ever expect to get and it's a close family so we're just trying to hold it together. A reward of $85,000 was offered to anyone with information that would help bring the college student home. Days went by without any sign of where Holly could have been taken but then several of her belongings started popping up at various places around town including her lunchbox, a receipt with her name on it, a card from school, and the sim card that had been removed from her phone. Early in the investigation, authorities suspected that the person who took Holly was someone known to her, and their suspicion immediately fell on her brother, Clint. Maybe he made up the story about his sister being taken by a man in camouflage to cover up that he was actually the one who hurt her. To eliminate their doubts, they went through his phone and computer and made him take a polygraph test. Eventually, he was cleared of any involvement in his sister's disappearance. Then, investigators started looking at the registered predators in the area to see if any of them fit the description of the man that Clint saw that morning. And one did. His name was Terry Britt, and he actually had a history of targeting young, blue-eyed, blonde women just like Holly. His home was also located in the direction where Holly's phone last pinged. When the police went to question him, he immediately got defensive, saying that he had not hurt anyone. He claimed that he was buying a bathtub at the salvage yard with his wife on the morning that Holly was taken. Although he produced a handwritten receipt for the bathtub, the store had no record of the sale. Investigators wiretapped his house, hoping that he would say something incriminating, but he never did. However, while he was being questioned, he made a pretty disturbing statement about Holly's kidnapping. She's young, pretty, perfect, somewhat body. Yeah. Okay like a toy, some people would think. See, this man, when he goes and gets this female, then he's gonna go snatch her up. Can't, he can't wait to get her to, to wherever he's gonna take her to because he's, he's wanting that body. But here comes reality. Now I've got a body. What am I gonna do with it? Because if you keep it, you gotta feed it. Right. You gotta hide it. It ain't gonna happen. And if you, and if you kill it, what you gonna do with? I mean, ain't, there's no way. But despite this sick statement, he maintained his innocence. 
And because investigators didn't have any evidence linking him to Holly, they had to let him go. Meanwhile, weeks had turned into months without any leads as to where Holly could be. And people were beginning to imagine the worst, but Holly's family was still holding on to hope that she could be alive. When Holly was at home, you know, she'd be asleep. Her hand would be kind of folded like this, and I would just slip my hand in her hand for just a few seconds. And I remember doing that after trying to feel her, thinking if I could just feel her hand in my hand. Three years went by without any significant progress on the case. But then in March 2014, police got a major breakthrough, and that led to the arrest of six men. The first to be arrested were Zach Adams, a local junkie, his brother Dylan, and their friend, Jason Autry. The investigation began with the arrest of Zach's brother Dylan on unrelated weapons charges. And during the arrest, he made a disturbing confession about Holly's disappearance. He told detectives that he had gone to his brother's house that morning to pick up his truck. But when he entered the house, he saw Holly sitting in a green chair in the living room, wearing a pink t-shirt with Jason standing over her. He noted that she was not in good shape and appeared to have been assaulted. He said that his brother had even admitted to doing vile things to Holly and videotaping it. This video, however, was never found even after the police searched Zach's property. Dylan also claimed that Zach had been wearing camouflage that day, which matched Clint's story. Dylan later recanted the confession, alleging that he was coerced into giving false information, and many people actually believed him because the details did not match the known evidence. Still, this confession led to the arrest of Zach, Dylan, Jason, and another man named Shane Austin. Then, on September 7th, 2014, a local man made a grim discovery while hunting for Gensig in the woods near I-40. He had seen a large bucket in the woods, and when he moved closer to investigate, he stumbled upon a human skull. There was a bullet hole piercing through the back of it on the right, with the trajectory going left. Tragically, the remains were confirmed to be Holly's. Alongside her remains, there were personal items, including a purse, lipstick, pen, and her inhaler. I just want to say to the bubba that I'm sorry for the loss. That all got shattered because of these men. First on Fox, breaking news right now in a local missing persons case, which is being followed in Tennessee and all across the nation tonight. A man is charged with the kidnapping and murder of Holly Bobo almost three years after the 20-year-old from Decatur County disappeared. Now tonight, Fox 17 has team coverage as Zachary Adams, the suspect, he is now in the Chester County Jail, indicted in this case. The question at this point, how law enforcement linked him to Holly Bobo's disappearance and murder? Zach, Dylan, and Jason were now charged with aggravated kidnapping, first-degree murder, and rape. A couple of other men, Jeffrey and Mark Percy, who were Zach and Dylan's cousins, were also arrested for being accessories and tampering with evidence, though the charges against them were later dropped. The detectives offered Shane an immunity deal for his testimony in court, but in February 2015, he took his life in a hotel room. Later, a gun belonging to him was found in a drainage ditch. The three remaining men vehemently denied involvement in the kidnapping and murder of Holly. However, in 2017, Jason accepted a deal to testify against Zach in exchange for a reduced prison sentence. He became the state's key witness and testified to a series of events that was drastically different from those in Dylan's confession. He testified that he was not involved in the abduction himself, but that he went to Shane's home to buy illicit substances, and he saw Shane, Dylan, and Zach disposing of evidence in a burn barrel. Zach also had a body in the back of his truck wrapped in a multicolored blanket. I pulled into the driveway, and I got out. The first thing I noticed was a burn barrel that was burning. The second thing was Dylan was standing in the doorway with a shirt off. Shane was walking around, saying, y'all need to hurry up and get the goddamn hell out of here. And hosting on his side was a fire. He said that Zach then asked him if he could help get rid of Holly's body, and he agreed to do it in exchange for narcotics. He asked me would I help him bury the body. And I said, yeah. As we got down, going down the road, I brought it to his attention that there were no shovels or pickaxes in the truck. How are we going to bury a body with no shovels or pickaxes? 
he looks at me and, and like he's lost. And I said, I don't know of nowhere a man can just pull up and get a shovels and pickaxes with a dead body in the vehicle. I told him that some years back that I had been underneath Interstate 40 Bridge and there was a body floating. And I told him, I said, the only thing holding the body up was the intestines. They drove to a spot along the Tennessee River with plans of gutting her body so that it would not float in the water. What was your plan of disposing of Holly's body? Mr. Butter put her in the deep end of the slough. I told him, I said, you put her in the deep end of that slough, turtles, and she had to eat it up. Like After unloading the body from the bed of the truck, they realized that Holly was still alive, and they decided to finish her off completely. And over the top of her, with my hands upon my knees, she being right here. And at that time, I see the foot move, a movement, and a, a, a sound of distress that sound like, hmm, come out of the voice, come out of her come from the blanket. At that time, I walked to the door, to the passenger side door of the pickup and Mr. Adams was digging in a fanny pack. I told him, I said, this fucking bitch is still alive. We just stopped for a second. I walked to the front of the truck. And I told Jack, I said, She's heard my name called and heard me talking and all. At that time, he wheels around, walks back to the driver's side pickup, out of the floorboard of the pickup, he pulls a pistol, the same pistol that was holstered on Mr. Austin's side at 30 Alice Springs Road. I looked around. And I told him that there was nothing coming close as clear, something to that, to that effect. And at that time, boom, the gun sounded, the gun went off. And it sounded like to me that it shot three or four times underneath that bridge. I had done made it back. I had done started my way back this way and it sounded like boom 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 underneath that bridge it was just one shot but it echoed underneath that bridge all the way down that damn river bottom fearing that the noise of the gunfire might have attracted attention zach and jason loaded the body back into the truck and zach dropped jason off Jason testified that Zach later told him that he had dumped the body near a place called Kelly Ridge, which is a different location from where Holly's body was found. Jason then said something interesting about how Zach, Dylan, and Shane were able to kidnap Holly from her home in the first place. What did Zach, or how did Zach respond? He said the real, he said the real reason that we were there was to show Clint how to manufacture meth. He said we got there early, she come outside screaming and raising hell, and we took her. Zach's defense attempted to discredit Jason by pointing out that he had motive to lie in exchange for a reduced sentence. They alleged that although some of his stories seemed to be corroborated, he had access to all the details through discovery. The defense also pointed to the fact that Zach's cell phone pings did not follow the path that Holly's cell phone took, and that none of the accused men matched the witness description given by Clint. The Adams brothers and Jason were all too tall and were either too slim or too heavy to be the abductor. While Shane was the correct weight and height, Clint described a man with dark hair that covered his neck. Shane had short red hair. The man that I saw I would describe as about 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 in height and about 200 pounds in weight. Would you agree with me that that is not the same physical size or stature of Zach Adams? I would. 
That is not correct. That is not. A former TBI agent, Terry Dickus, who had been the lead investigator on the case, testified for the defense. He told the jury that he ruled the men out early in the case because Shane passed a polygraph, their alibis checked out, and cell phone records put Zach and Holly several miles apart during the critical time frame. He also admitted that the investigation was not handled correctly. The left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. We were feeding all of this information in and we didn't realize what was there. Their alibis or their stories were not checked out. Not thoroughly. checked out. It was a mistake. Yes. It was a mistake. The defense argued that the investigators were so desperate to close the case that they unfairly targeted her client. The most expensive and most exhaustive investigation in the history of the state of Tennessee. And yet, when they came to 2013, they had nothing. Zach's defense alleged that the initial suspect in the case, Terry Britt, was the real killer, saying that he has never been cleared by investigators and that the government had more evidence of his guilt than it does of these three defendants. Reportedly, Clint had even identified a voice sample of Terry's voice as being similar to the voice he heard that morning. However, several other witnesses testified that Zach made statements implicating himself in Holly's kidnapping and murder. You know, I was... I was there for the worst of it, and I was like, well, did you do it? And he was like, I, I was there for the worst of it, and he just left it like that. Did he tell you what had happened to her body? Yes, ma'am, he did. Um, he told me that um, the bottom the bottom side was found in one part of Tennessee, and then some other some other pieces was found other where. But did he say what had happened to her body before that? It had got chopped up. Zach's ex-girlfriend also testified that he had once threatened to tie her up and do to her what he had done to Holly. He said he would tie me up just like he did Holly Bobo and nobody would ever see me again. Zach had also allegedly threatened his brother after his arrest that he would put him in a hole beside her if he didn't keep his mouth shut. Meanwhile, Holly's family was still struggling to keep it together through the trial. But at some point, it was just too much for Karen that she passed out on the stand after seeing Holly's belongings. Holly have an inhaler? Yes, she did. On September 22nd, 2017, a jury found Zach guilty on all charges. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. His brother Dylan pleaded guilty to the charges of facilitation of first degree murder and especially aggravated kidnapping. He was sentenced to 35 years in prison. Finally, after six and a half years, I do feel that we got justice for our daughter. We have lived a hard life and walk on a, an extremely unimaginable hard road for six and a half years. So I did consider that in our decision for the future in hopes that maybe we can start to rebuild what life we have left. And if there is any joy to be found in life anymore, then we can start finding it. After his plea deal, Jason received a reduced sentence of eight years and was released in 2020. But later, he recanted his testimony, saying that he made up the entire story so he could get out of jail. Following this, he was arrested for an unrelated firearm charge and sentenced to nearly 20 years in prison. In January 2024, Zach filed a petition that his conviction be overturned on the basis of this new evidence. As of June 2024, he's awaiting new trial. What do you think about this case and how the police handled it? Do you think Zach is the killer or was he just a scapegoat? Let me know in the comments and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell button.